So we are going to start uh, today where we left off in the last class. So before we get there, let's just talk about the announcements. Home homework three is due tonight. Homework four has also been posted and it is due uh, next Friday, so October uh, 2nd. Studio 3, you, uh, some of you have already gotten checked off for that. Some of you have already submitted that on Gradescope. So that's really good. Uh, it is due next, uh, sorry, October 7th. So you have a, uh, some time to do this. However, it is probably one of the most complicated studios that you will do this in this class. So I would recommend you to start early. Um, and also I have posted under studio resources, the uh, video link for Studio 3 information uh, and I would recommend that you watch that and then start with Studio 3. Uh, in that case, you, you, things might go a lot smoother. Quiz 7 uh, is on grade scope, which is due today. So uh, I have given this particular quiz, Quiz 7, based on the problems from the previous six quizzes in which uh, the average was not uh, very high. So it was uh, a little bit lower than 80%. So I, 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 I have given the questions again to you guys so that you guys get this uh, absolutely correct. Uh, let's see, there's a question in the chat box. Can you remind me what is function table? A truth table is a function table. All right, so let's see. That is as far as announcements are concerned. Um, and let's talk about, let's continue talking about the Boolean algebra properties. So the place where we stopped in the previous lecture was 11D. And we'll start off today with property number 12. It's De Morgan's law. And De Morgan's law, uh, if you guys can mute yourself, it'll be helpful. I don't know if I, so if I say mute all, I don't know if, even know if it, that helps. Okay. Thank you guys. All right, so De Morgan's law simply says that if you have a bunch of binary variables, let's call them uh, X and Y and Z, and you may have many uh, in that list. If you do an OR operation, X or Y or Z or and so on, and you complement the entire thing that is indicated by this apostrophe, then that is equivalent to saying, I will complement each of the binary variables, X and Y and Z and so on, but also the operator R becomes AND. So everything is getting complemented. X is becoming X complement, R is becoming AND, and on the left-hand side, you have the, the, the overall complement. So uh, let me write down a simple uh, expression, which involves just uh, two inputs. So this is saying, if you had say, for example, X or Y, and the entire thing is complemented, it would equal X complement and Y complement. And you can quickly prove this using the truth table method or the Venn diagram method. Uh, one of those two will abs uh, w work and you will quickly see that. And in one of the homework problems, you did something similar, maybe with 12 or maybe with 12D, but you did something similar to this. Um, let's see. One thing that you want to note over here is this is absolutely not equal to that. So that's something that you want to really be careful of. And again, you can check that uh, by using a truth table have a column for X, have a column for Y, and then have a column for X complement and Y complement, and then have a column for X NAND Y. Uh, if there is a mix of operations, do we complement those two? Yes. So that is property number 13. I will get, get I will get there in just a minute. Um, now let's talk about 12D, which is the dual of property 12. It says that if you have the odds and the ands switched, then De Morgan's law has its dual. So over here we have on the left side, we have X, Y, Z, and so on, many variables. And when it, on the right side, you have X complement, Y complement, Z complement, and so on. And also the, the complement on the left side is actually making that inversion possible. 
the operators also get complemented. So all ands are becoming ors. And we, if we write a very simple version for this, let me write that in blue, it would mean that if you have two variable case, x and y, it would equal x complement or y complement. And it is absolutely not equal to that. And that's something that you want to see, that, that, that it's not equal there. Now, using symbols, I can also say this, right? So let me try to show this using symbols uh, for 12D. So 12D says NAND. What is NAND? I'm going to draw two lines for two inputs. I'm going to draw NAND here. X, Y, and that would be NAND. So 12D says that is equivalent to complementing the inputs first, X complement, Y complement, and then putting them through an OR gate. Now, a really, you know, uh, easy way to uh, look at this is, imagine these bubbles are getting pushed through the OR gate and they appear on the output side. So these bubbles, as they push through this OR gate, they appear on the left, uh, on, the, on, on the output side. And while they are getting pushed through that OR gate, the OR gate also gets complemented to uh, AND gate. So it's a convenient way of looking at it. But that's De Morgan's law. In words, you can say this as NAND is equivalent to invert out inputs then OR. Now I've just shown you this for 12D, you can write similar uh, symbol relationship and words for 12 as well. Now for 13, property number 13, it actually is the general case for both 12 and 12D. And it says, if you have a function in which you have many variables, x1, x2, x3, and so on up to xn. So you have n binary variables. And in that function, you also have zero and one and so on. And you have odds and ands. And if you complement that on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, all those variables get complemented. The zeros become ones, ones become zeros, odds become ands, and ands become or. Everything gets complemented. So 13 is a sort of a general um, e uh, uh, Boolean algebra property that covers 12 and 12D. Let me know that. All right, so that's 12, 12D and 13. Now we are going to move into uh, 16 and 17. So these are the, the last two uh, Boolean algebra properties. We will try to prove uh, some of them using uh, other Boolean algebra properties. So f means function, yes. So f is a logic function that is dependent on x1, x2, has zeros, has ones, and so on. Yeah, there is a there, there is a there is a typo in the list. There is no 14 and 15. They, it just jumps to 16 and 17. So ignore that, please. All right. So let's take a look at um, property number 16, and let's try to prove that. Uh, let me see. Can I prove it here? Yes, I can prove it here. So this is property number 16. So I will start with the left hand side here first. Uh, because it, it'll be easier for me to manipulate the left-hand side. So I'm going to use a foil on this and I will just uh, expand it into four terms. So my left-hand side would be X and with X complement or X with Z or X complement and Y or Y and Z, right? And once I write this, I can quickly eliminate some uh, one of this term, which is this guy. 
right? That is essentially zero because x and x complement has to be zero, one of the previously proved Boolean algebra property. But the others, I will not be able to do much with them. Now, this is very interesting point in the proof. Now you see, if I highlight my current left-hand side, and if I highlight my right-hand side, where I uh, really want to take this proof to, the only thing that I observe is, I, I somehow need to figure out a way to eliminate this term, right? The other two terms are exactly the same. So I need to figure out a way to eliminate y and z term. So the trick here is to force the missing literal on the term that needs to be eliminated. So I'm going to say that in words here, force missing literal, literal is a binary variable, force missing literal on the term that needs to be eliminated. And I've figured out the term that I need eliminated by observing the current left hand side and the right hand side. It is y and z. I need that eliminated. So what I'm going to do is force the missing literal. What is the missing literal in that term? x is missing in that term. So I'm going to force that onto that term. But while doing that, I'm going to be very careful so as to not change the value of the left hand side. I cannot change the function itself. I have to keep that function valid. So for example, in arithmetic algebra, what do you do? You multiply and divide by five, say for example, right? So you, you are manipulating things, but you're making sure that you're not changing things. All right, so let me continue with that proof. So zero goes away. I'm still left with X and Z, still have X complement and Y. And over here, the crucial step is to force X onto that term but as I do that, you see, I forced X. That's the thing that I included here. But X or X complement will always be one. And one and Y and Z will be Y and Z. So I did not change the function. I simply forced that missing literal. So in other words, I have actually uh, made my expression longer. But I did that so that I can combine more later on which will help with the elimination of y and z term. So I'm going to write this next step. Uh, I've got x and y and z or x complement and y and z. Now what I'm going to notice is, can I have something common between any pair of terms? So I recognize that x and z and the third term x, y, and z have x and z that is common. The next thing that I'm going to notice is x complement and y and x complement and y and z have x complement and y that is common to, to them. So I'm just going to simply combine them like that. So I'm going to say between the first and the third term, I've got X and Z common and from the second and the third, uh, the fourth term, I've got X complement and Y that is common. So one or uh, let's see Z. So these two went here and these two went here. And that's it. So now I'm just going to highlight some. So all of this is simply one. All of this is simply one. So I'm going to get X and Z or X complement and Y, which is my right hand side. So that's how you would put one or Y. What is that? One or Y? 
Mm. Oh yes, you got you, yes. You're right. That should be one or y. One or y over there. One or z over there. Yes. Thank you. Right. So it's not just grouping terms. Uh, like like the, so that is the second step. But in order for you to group the like terms, you need to first force the missing literals so that you be, are able to combine more, right? So the, if you did not do the first step or this step, you wouldn't be able to do that. So we are strategically trying to force that missing literal on the term that needs to be eliminated so that we can combine them later. All right, so let's move on here. Um, actually 16, the proof of 16 also proves 17. So in 17, uh, if you can see, that is exactly the same as where we were over here. So with the with this step, oh sorry, from here to here. So that is literally seventeen. So while we were proving sixteen, we also proved seventeen. Are we always allowed to multiply by any logical one? Yes, you can always do that, but you want to do that strategically, right? You just don't want to keep making things complicated for no reason. You want to do that strategically. So you can always multiply by a logic one. So I wouldn't call it multiply. I would say and, and with logic one, you can also or with logic zero. Oh, you see this? So I will be talking more about how you can uh, leverage other tricks in this. But the way you make sure that you're not going down a dead end is by recognizing which term you want eliminated. So that's the one that you are going to attack, right? So you can prevent that by carefully observing where you are in the proof currently and where you want to reach to. But when we start talking about Karnoff maps, I will try to show you a comparison between Boolean algebra and Karnoff maps and how you can be a, be a little bit more structured in terms of how you manipulate your Boolean algebra expressions. But with the, with the strategies that we have right now, the one that we have right now is to force the missing literal on the term that needs to be eliminated. that's one uh, sort of drawback with Boolean algebra. The drawback is there is no absolute way to say whether I have done this correctly or not. Well, not I, I take that back. There is no perfect way to say I have uh, found the simplest logic expression. I have minimized this logic expression and this is it. I cannot go further. There is no structured way to do that in Boolean algebra, which is why we we are going to talk about Karnoff maps later on. For some cases where the number of variables are uh, very small, you can say, yeah, you, I cannot do anything about this anymore. But for some cases in which the variables are three, four, five, then it might be a little bit difficult to to know or to determine whether it is the simplest form or not. All right, so let's see. I have proved 16, which means I have also proved 16D, considering uh, the principle of duality. But if I was specifically asked to pro prove 16D, I would, uh, wh what would you do? So if the question was, prove 16D using Boolean algebra properties, what would you do? Would you start with the left-hand side or would you start with the right-hand side? 
right hand side. Yes. So I would start with the right hand side. I would expand this in four terms and then I would recognize which terms I need to be eliminated to get my right hand side. And that's how I would use the same trick I, as I used in property 16 and, and, and go about proving that. And while I do 16D, I will also have proved 17D just as we did for 16 and 17. All right, you guys, this was, uh, this is okay. All right. So let me add just a, a, a note here. Uh, let's see. Ending with logical one doesn't change logic expression. And similarly, oring with logic zero doesn't change logic expression. So when using the proof, we can use either side to side. Yes, you can absolutely start wherever you want and then you will have to go to the other side. So uh, it depends on a personal choice. Some people are, uh, you know, good with the foil and then going to the other side. Some people might try to uh, have a different strategy. Absolutely okay. You can start from one of the sides and go to the other. All right, let's go on to some sample problems. So just as uh, for the sake of practice, I'm going to do these three Boolean algebra. Oh, can you go back to consensus theorem? Yes, right here. All right. So what we'll do next is uh, for the sake of practice, we will try to simplify an expression, verify the equation, and in part C, we will try to simplify the expression such that the result has only two literals. So I'll start with A and then go to B and then go to C. A is right here. I should probably call this A. So my logic function is f equals x nor y or x nor z, everything is complemented. Now, when I start seeing so many complements, I actually feel very comfortable with this because I know as I see more and more complement signs, the bars over expressions, I can really leverage the De Morgan's law. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first apply De Morgan's law to rewrite this. So what do I have? So I, I can say A complement or B complement, the whole complement is going to be what? A double complement and B double complement, right? Just based on De Morgan's law. So I'm going to use that over here. So just to, so that there is a is all of this and B is all of this, right? So what do I have in the first step? I have X or Y double complement. The R is become, going to become and, and the moment R becomes and, I will need parentheses to go around this. And then I have X or Z double complement again. And we know double complement cancels out. So this guy cancels out, that guy cancels out as well. So what I'm left with is X or Y and X or Z. Now I can use one of the properties uh, that we saw earlier to write the next step, or I can actually go through the proof, right? Th there, is a, there is a property that gives you the simplest version of, of this from here. Uh, X or Y and X or Z. So here, let me show you where that is. Uh, 
Mm, no, not here. Where is it? Right here. So property 8D that we proved actually just says, okay, you can use this to write the answer. Um, X or Y and Z. So we already know what the answer should be. But let us just go through the steps. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use foil here. I'm going to say X and X or uh, X and Z and X and Y, Y and Z. X and X is X. X and Z can't do anything about that. X and Y can't do anything about that y and z remains as is. Now the, the next thing that I'm going to note is in the first three terms, there is a x that is common to the first three terms. So I can do that. And the reason why I did that is so that I get a one right here because one or anything is just a one. So that will simplify to x and 1 or y and z which is x or y and z that's your simplest form and the question asked specifically that the result has to have three literals only and we exactly have three literals one two and three a literal is any appearance of a binary variable either in true form or complemented form. Let's write that uh, definition. Literal. Appearance of a binary variable in a logic expression either in true form true or complemented form complemented form which means a counts as a, 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 a literal a complement also counts as a literal so for example, let's see, f equals x, and, so let's see, x and y complement or z and w and uh, y. How many literals are there in this expression? Five is right. Now, why is this important? Why is this uh, important to note, the number of literals? Anyone? Fan in, okay, fan. So even if I kept the fan in low, so for example, if I had I actually have more literals here, but a lesser fan in. Number of transistors needed, absolutely right. Because you see, you will implement this using transistors. And the more number of literals you will have, that will mean that you have more number of transistors. So the real estate of your logic function is going to increase, which means the cost of your logic expression, logic function is going to increase. So the lower, the lower the literals, the cheaper and smaller your design is going to be, right? So that is one of the ways you can keep track of how costly your uh, logic function is. So you want number of literals to be as low as possible. All right, we are going to be doing this B. What are we doing? We are verifying this, right? So we, we verify this. 
and as usual we can take the left hand side go to the right hand side or we can do the other way around as well so for me i'm going to take the left hand side just because if i start with the right hand side it is going to need some sort of creativity on my part to to go to the left hand side it is actually going to be a little bit more difficult so i will start with the left hand side again i see a lot of complement signs which means de morgan's law is going to be very useful here so let's see i have got x and y complement this will get complemented the or will become and and for separation i will just use parentheses here and then the next term is going to be x complement and y the entire thing gets complemented so i've literally used the de morgan's law to write this i've complemented the first piece i've complemented the second piece i've also complemented the operator in the middle and just so that i'm uh, I, i'm i'm very careful in terms of which i evaluate first so i have used parentheses to do that without the parentheses it would become a little bit more tricky now one thing that i uh, want to point out here is you see this x complement and y term you don't want this to be uh, so this is okay right you don't want that to be like that right that, that can create confusion is your bar stopping with x is your bar going on to y where is it right so in order to avoid this confusion what you can do is you can put a dot in the middle and make sure that x the bar is only on the left side so be very careful you might not just confuse the person who is looking at it you might actually confuse yourself uh, if you're not careful so that you know you're going through multiple steps if you miss one then the later proof will be messed up all right let's uh, erase this come back here continue with the proof all right so use de morgan's law let's use de morgan's law again for each of these terms i've got x complement the and becomes or the y becomes double complemented still keeping the parentheses and remains as is x double complement and becomes or y complement the double can double complement cancels out here and here so what do i have i have x complement or y anded with x or y complement now i can use foil to expand it out i've got what x complement and x or x complement and y complement or x and y or y and y complement this term goes to zero this term goes to zero and you are left with your answer x complement and y complement or x and y which is actually your right hand side it is also x nor y so that's how you would verify this questions about this proof all right looks like you guys are doing good here all right so the this is part c part c is actually is there a reason that x and y is written without the dot and x right so x and y right so x and y there is no bar over it so that's fine there, there, there is no confusion there's no bar over it so you know there's this you can put a dot you can not put a dot it doesn't really matter but when there is a bar over x or y or both that's when you need to be very careful when there is no bar there there is no there is no confusion i am confused about the exclusive nor part okay so let's take a look so at the at the beginning of lecture oh, so this is the third slide of Uh, lecture three, where we looked at exclusive nor and exclusive or gates. So exclusive nor 
is actually x and y and x complement and y complement. That's the truth table. That's the symbol. And if you notice, this guy is literally what we had um, just now. So by just recognizing that, I wrote that as a simple, simple form. All right, let's go to part C. Now, when you see part C, it has so many literals, it has so many terms. So it might be a little bit intimidating at first. But if you start noticing something, it becomes very, very easy. The thing that I would notice is there's an X here, there's an X there, there's an X there, and there's an X there. So four terms have X in them. So the first step I would do is to pull out an X from the four terms. I would get one that I really, really wanted. And then I got Y and Z, and then I've got W, and I've also got W complement from all of that, from the four terms. And then what I'm left with is, uh, let's see, I've got this term and this term left over. And in the terms that is left over, there is, there is something that is common to those terms as well, which is X complement and Y. And then you have Z here, one here. That's it. So all of this is one, all of this is one. So you can quickly write X or X complement and Y. Now X or X complement Y might actually seem like it is the simplest form, but it isn't. Using property 11D, it is actually X or Y. So the way I've gone from here to here is using property 11D. Uh, let me go back, show you what 11D is. 11D is right here. X and Y complement or Y equals X or Y. In our case, the, the variables might have been switched. That's okay, but it's the same property. Should we memorize these properties or will we always have access to them? You will always have access to them. What you should really focus on is how to use which property and when. So that, that you, you will, you don't need to memorize them. This will be, um, this will be provided to you all the properties will be provided to you uh, during the exams, during the homeworks. You should certainly ask, uh, look them up. Don't memorize them, please. But it turns out if you use it uh, many times, by default, you will probably memorize it even even though you don't want to. All right, so let's that's part C. And this has two, letter, two literals. That was the goal for part C. Simplify it so as to get two literals. And we did X, Y, two literals, that's it. Now, the same problems have been uh, simplified, verified, and proved here. So if you want to access them in order to look up exactly which property was used, you can look at this as well. But the fact that we went through them in detail, I'm not gonna go through them again. That was A, that was B, and that was C, and uh, uh, two different ways of doing part C. Now let's take a look at De Morgan's Law and a concept of pushing bubbles around. This turns out to be like a fun topic because it is about graphing bubbles and you know, it, it can be fun, but it can also become quite confusing. So let's try to uh, tr try to deal with this. 
So what we are trying to do is we know what De Morgan's law property looks like in the form of an expression, but we are going to draw things related to De Morgan's law, but in terms of logic diagrams that are shown over here. So for example, if I take a look at um, this particular logic diagram, I have got two levels here, right? So two levels, level one is here and level two is here. Why am I calling them two levels? Because all of this happens at the same time and all of this happens at the same time, right? So they are, those AND gates are uh, operating at the same time. They are in one level and the second level happens later. So that this is a what we call a two level network. It is actually a two level sum of products network because this guy is doing the sum and this is doing the product. Not the arithmetic product, the logical product, which is and. Log not the arithmetic sum, the logical sum, which is or. Now, let us try to take a look at this and see how we can push bubbles through. So suppose your, our goal was to convert this implementation into a NAND only sim implementation. So what I'll do is this actually, I will just add another slide here and talk about uh, universal gates. What are universal gates? Universal gates are logic gates that can be used to synthesize any logic function. Meaning, you give me any logic function, I will be able to make a NAND only synthesis for that. So universal gates are NAND gates and NOR gates, which is why they are very attractive. They require less number of transistors, uh, they have a faster response time, or I should say propagation delay is small because of less number of transistors. Uh, they are easily accessible. So if I'm buying logic gates, instead of buying AND or NOT, the basic gates, I'm just gonna invest in NAND, or I may just invest in NOR. So one way of doing this, so basic gates are what? Basic gates are AND, or not. So that's one way of synthesizing a logic network, something in which you have and, or, and not. And another way of doing this is by just using NAND. Another way of doing this is just by using NOR. So everything, all the, all the logic gates will appear NAND. All the logic gates will appear NOR for the same function. So that's the goal. I want to leverage only one type of gate. So I will take my logic function and synthesize it using NAND gates only. And I have another option, NOR gates only. So how can I do that? I do that by using the De Morgan's law and pushing bubbles around. So I'll show you an example here. This is a one such example. So you see what I did over here. If I wanted a NAND only synthesis, let me write that over here, NAND, if I wanted NAND only. What would I need to do for the AND gate? Well, you would say, if, if you want to do this for the uh, AND gate, you add a bubble at the front of the NAND gate, uh, AND gate, right? So you see, no bubble, 
you have a bubble there. That's how you converted that AND gate into NAND gate. But I cannot just add one bubble. I need to add two bubbles to cancel them out. So on that same wire, I've added another bubble to cancel it out. It is on the same line. Similarly, I have added another bubble here and I have another added another bubble there as shown. Now you see, once I add those bubbles, this guy is already NAND, this guy is already NAND, and if you see this, this guy is actually NAND as well. How do I know that? Well, just write the expression X complement or Y complement equals X NAND Y. We know that from De Morgan's law. So that's actually a NAND gate as well. So at the, at the beginning, we had AND gates and OR gates. At the end, we have just NAND gates. So what we have here at the end is a NAND only synthesis. Now the trick is for the AND gates, you are trying to add bubbles at the front. For the OR gate, you are trying to add bubbles at the input side. But while you are adding these bubbles, you are making sure that you always add two at a time to cancel them out. All right, so let's uh, let's go on to, so I also claimed that we, can, we could have done this by just using NOR gates. And I'll talk about that slightly later. Uh, what I'm going to need before I talk about that is, uh, I'll do this first. The question is, can I synthesize a NOT gate using a NAND gate? So what I want is a NOT gate, but I, what I have is a NAND. So can I use NAND in such a way that I get a NOT, NOT functionality? The answer is yes, because I've already claimed that NAND is a universal gate. Any logic function to be can be implemented by just using NAND gates. So a NOT gate should also be able to, I should be able to do that. So let's take a look. Now in order to find this answer, what I'm going to do is use a Boolean algebra property. What is X and X? X. Okay, so if X and X is X, if I complement both sides, what do I get? I get X NAND X equals X complement. You see, this guy is NAND, this guy is NOT. So the trick is, if you want a NOT gate, if you want, uh, let's see, if you want a NOT gate, uh, all you would have to do is use a two input NAND gate but tie the inputs together, X and X. So you've got X here, oh, you've got X here, you've got X complement here, you've got X here, that means you've got X here, X here, you've got X, and X, which is X complement. So you see, wherever I need a NOT gate, I can simply put this guy. a NAND gate with both inputs tied together. That's my NOT. And similarly, I can do this for the NOR as well. So the question is, can I synthesize a NOT gate using NOR? For this, I will start off with a logic, uh, with a Boolean algebra property of X or X. What is X or X? We know that it is X. Now, complement both sides. What does that become? X nor X is X complement. Done.
not gate is equivalent to a nor gate with both inputs tied together. So I can also, that's my second option. I can also synthesize a NOT gate by simply tying the NOR gate inputs together. NOR gates with two inputs tied together. All right, let's take a look at some questions that have come through. Uh, should we memorize? No. What is the physical meaning of the same transistors? Is that faster or better than the others? So it doesn't matter about the number of transistors. What really matters is the number of levels that you have to go through. In general, you can assume that more transistors, meaning if, if, if things have to go through more transistors, then of course the time taken to reach at the output is going to be more. So in general, you can assume that, but it's not necessarily the case. Uh, would we ever actually want a NAND as a not? Yes, you got it, yes. Sometimes you would want that. What if you don't have a NOT gate? What if all you bought was NAND gates? You wanted to save money. So you said, all right, I, you know, I'm going to only invest in NAND gates because I can use them everywhere. So use them even for NOT, yes. Uh, would we ever go from having three gates in a circuit to maybe five? Yes, that's a very good question. Yes, you can go from three gates in a circuit to five gates. And the problem that you are trying to solve there is fan in. That's a very good question. So suppose I have five input R gate. This is exactly the same as saying one, two, or uh, one, two, or. So if, if, if fan in is a problem, then from one, then I solve that by increasing the number of gates, increasing the number of levels, to get around the problem of fan in you can do that so it de really depends on what problem you are having all right so let's see now let's come to this this is a complete list of how the de morgan symbols are related to each other and some of these are directly from the boolean algebra properties so for example if you see the first one what is this? X or Y? That's the symbol on the left. Uh, let me see. That guy is the symbol on the left. And this guy here, X complement NAND Y complement in the sim is the symbol on the right. And the claim is that they are both the same. Are they the same? Well, you can t just zoom in on this and say, if X NAND Y is x complement and y complement that's based on de morgan's law then of course if i complement both sides i get that which is exactly that in other words i'm able to synthesize or represent or gate by using a nand gate but with inverted inputs. You guys see that? And similarly, you have a bunch of them. You have a bunch of uh, uh, relationships. So for if, if you wanted NOR, uh, this is, well, this is straight away from De Morgan's law. There's, there's no, there's not even a change there. Uh, this is also from De Morgan's law, but you have complemented both sides of the De Morgan's law. Straight from De Morgan's law. Actually, let me just write their properties. Uh, let me see what property was uh, the first one, maybe the second one. 
the second one with the nor uh, come on what property was that uh, second one with the nor was the property number 12 so this is property 12 and this is property 12 D complemented complemented on both sides oh not 12 D this is just 12 complemented this is 12 D and this is 12 D complemented on both sides so we are literally writing the Boolean algebra property that we referenced earlier and seeing how they how those those expressions map to the symbols on the left. Now for a buffer, which is essentially come on. Okay. So for a buffer, how would I represent an alternative symbol? I can put two bubbles here, one on the input side, one on the op output side, and that would represent a buffer. For an inverter, I could have the bubble at the output or I could have the bubble at the input. Now, why why do uh, why are these important? They, these are important because as you are pushing bubbles through, you may want to cancel out certain bubbles that you don't need. And you, this this these two symbol that those symbols can help with that. Let us do a a, a sample problem here. Uh, let's see. Actually, let me let me do this. Over here, my goal is going to be to synthesize an AND gate, but to synthesize an AND gate, I'm going to use only NAND gates on the left side. And I'm going to use only NOR gates on the right side. Let us see if, I, if we can do this. So I'm starting off with na uh, AND, right? So let me just draw the AND gate. Uh, this is my AND gate. Now, if I want to convert this to a NAND gate, what should I do? Well, I should try to put a bubble in front of it. So let me draw the bubble in front in red. Can I just add one bubble? No, I need to add two bubbles. So I need one bubble there and I also need a NOT gate. So in red, I have added on top of the AND gate. What I have is one NAND, but the output of the NAND is also complemented. I go back to AND. Now I know that I can represent NOT gate using NAND gates. All I would have to do is tie the inputs together. So that is my NAND and I will take the output of the NAND and I will feed it into a NAND gate double complemented. So you see that that is now that, that is now that. So what do you think you will get? So if you have X and Y here you would get x and y here, x, y here, you would get x and y here. And as you can see, you have just used NAND gates to synthesize an AND gate. Questions about this? Simple enough? All right, let's do a, a slightly more complicated one. Nor only. Again, I start with the same AND gate. So I'm gonna start with the same AND gate here. Where should I put the bubbles to go to NOR?
the input side, the output side. The input, yes, you got it. So let me add bubbles at the input side. I need two of them. I added two of them. If I add two bubbles over here, that is not enough. I also need to cancel those two bubbles. So the way I would cancel those two bubbles is by adding two not gates. So now we are back. That bubble cancels with that bubble, that bubble cancels with that bubble, we are good. So if you had X here and Y here, you would get X uh, and Y here. Remember, we are trying to synthesize AND gate using NOR only. So what is this? That is a NOR gate using De Morgan's law. That is NOR. X So that is done. What is left? The two NOT gates. So the two NOT gates using NOR only, we know that we can do this, right? Just tie the two inputs together. So we'll do that. Let's come back. So this is going to be a little bit of a bigger logic diagram. So let's go through this. So I've got one NOR gate here for the inverter. I've got another NOR gate over here for the inverter. And I've got the third NOR gate over here for the uh, last gate. So let's see, let me just point arrows so that you guys can see. This went to here, that went to here, that went to here. And if you had X here, Y here, you would get X and Y. So we still are synthesizing AND gate, but we are using only NOR gates to do that. Connection. In connection. All right, questions about this? All right. Now, the next thing that we are doing is trying to prove that X exclusive or Y is X complement NAND Y, NAND X NAND Y complement. So a lot of complements over here. And we are trying to prove this by pushing bubbles through. We are going to build the exclusive OR gate using NAND gates. That's exactly what we are trying to, uh, trying to prove, uh, trying to, uh, you know, figure out whether we can ex do it, do exclusive R by just using NAND. So let's try to do that over here. How would you do that over here? That is your exclusive R operation. You see, I can quickly verify that. This is, uh, this is Y here. That is X here. So this is X complement here. This is Y here. So this is X complement and Y, y. and this guy would be what? X and y complement so this would be x complement and y or x and y complement which is x exclusive or y right so th this is the logic diagram using basic gates for an exclusive or operation also called as the and or gate diagram so the first level is and And the second level is or. You see, I've, I've, I've sketched that vertically. 
right? So every gate in that level, it would be in that level. Every gate over here would be in that level. So it has to do with the propagation delay. If it is the same, then they all belong to that same level. If they are functioning, if, they are, if their operations are being carried out at the same time, then they can be combined into one level. All right, so the, 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 the uh, proof here is, how can I convert this only into NAND gates, right? This, all of this is, all the gates that are involved over here has NAND gates. So how do I do that? Well, let us just do this over here, but maybe use an interesting color, maybe use pink to manipulate. Add a bubble there, add a bubble there to cancel it. Add a bubble there, add a bubble there to cancel it. All of this becomes NAND. All of this is NAND. All of this is also NAND. The only thing that we have not done is the bubble there and the bubble there, which is fine because we are not trying to prove this. Uh, we, we are trying to prove this with X complement and Y complement. So that, that's okay, right? So th this comes over here. I And that comes over here. So that's how you would prove that exclusive R can be implemented using NAND gates, but with the exception that uh, X and Y are inverted once. So let's see, that's your proof step by step. Original diagram at the top, bottom left has the bubbles added, right? So this cancels with that, that cancels with this, and then you recognize that there are three AND gates. NAND gates, sorry. NAND, NAND, and NAND, which leads to that expression. All right. Questions, you guys. Could I have done this exclusive OR gate by just using NOR gates? Yes, you could have. You just need to figure out where to add the bubble. Where would I add the bubble to this? Let's just take, take that. Uh, let's just uh, try to take uh, only this guy. Just for the sake of example, how would you convert this blue shaded thing to NOR gate? Where would you add the bubbles? Bubble at input Y. Yes, you got it. You would not, you would not add two bubbles. You just would add one bubble, but you would have to also cancel that bubble. You got it. So I'm going to put one bubble here and I'm going to put a NOT gate over here. That's it. So that would become a NOR, but I would have to still uh, do the inverter. That's my inverter. And that feeds into this with the, now the, all of this is becoming a NOR, right? Done. So the, the point that I'm make, trying to make here is you don't have to add bubbles all the time. If they are already present, use them. You don't add extra. All right.
Now let's start talking about combinational analysis. What is combinational? What is analysis? Combinational means these type of circuits do not have memory. Combinational circuits do not have memory. So, so far, whatever we have been seeing in terms of logic diagrams, there was no memory involved. So combinational, I'm just going to write the definition here. Combinational means circuits uh, where output or outputs could be many. depend on the combination, the keyword combination, hence combinational, depend on the combination of present inputs. No memory, in other words. its opposite or its counterpart is sequential circuits. Sequential circuits are circuits in which have memory. That is later in the course. But right now we are looking at combinational analysis. So things are not having any memory and you have a function over here, right? Some logic function f that depends on x, y and z. And F obviously depends on the present combination of the inputs X, Y, and Z. So if I tell you what X is, Y is, Z is, you will be able to tell me what F is. There's no memory. It is dependent on present inputs. It is dependent on the combination of present inputs. So suppose we were trying to take this and uh, we were trying to figure out what is its functionality. In other words, we are trying to figure out what is the truth table of this particular function. Suppose we were trying to do that. We were trying to fill out a truth table for this. So, so for example, you have X as an input, Y as an input, Z as an input, and the output is F, right? Suppose you are trying to fill this out. How would you go about doing this? How would you fill out the truth table? So, one way to do this is to start writing all of these combinations. You would get eight of them. Look at each case from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1. Okay, so that's one way, right? And then you would evaluate F for that, F for that, F for that, ta, 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 F for that, right? That's one way of doing it. But I'm going to, yes, determine the logic expression. I'm going to advise you guys not to do this because it will take a long time. It is not an elegant way of doing, uh, or not an elegant way to fi find the functionality of this. Instead, I will recommend this. At every stage of your circuit, try to write the logic expression. And for all the, all the things that are in the middle, you are essentially writing intermediate logic expressions. So for example, what would you write over here? You would say X or Y complement. And then what would you write over here? You would say X or Y complement is ended with Z. What would you write over here? You would say, uh, let's see, X complement and Y and Z complement. And then F would simply be, so all of these are intermediate logic expressions. The final logic expression or the overall logic expression would be for F, where F equals X or Y complement and Z or 
x complement and y and z complement. Right? You guys see that? So that's your logic expression. So you know what the functionality is right now. But a, a little bit, not, not everything. So let me show you a very convenient way to write, fill out the truth table next. So what I'll do is I'll simply copy this over here and then go to my next page and paste my logic expression for f. And I've got f equals that, right? Uh, come on. Now I will try to set it up as a truth table. On the input side, I have got x, y, and z. On the output side, I have got f. Then I will do the, the usual, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Two zeros and two ones and two zeros and two ones, and then four zeros and four ones. Now, observe this. This guy is literally going to equal x and z or y complement and z or x complement and y and z complement. Oh no, not k map. This is just a truth table. So I've got three terms here. One, two, oh, let me use it. Two and three. Now, if the third term is very simple. X complement, Y, Z complement. Where is that in the truth table? X is zero, Y is one, Z is zero. Zero, one, zero. So that's where F is going to be one. How about X and Z? Well, le let's do this first. X and Z doesn't depend on Y. But for that particular term, X is one, Z is one. So where is X one and Z one? Here, here. One there, one there. Next, Y should be zero, Z should be one. Y should be zero, oh, sorry, no. Y should be zero and Z should be one. And y should be zero, uh, z should be one. All right, so it's it's kind of double here. One, that is already one, so I don't need to change that. And then everything else is going to be a zero. Done. So you guys see how to go from a logic diagram to a logic expression to a truth table. Questions about this? So that particular form is called a sum of products form because it is a product, 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 and sum of all those products. In other words, you can say R of AND terms, right? So you can say like R of ANDed terms. Of course, there is going to be a POS, product of sum, We'll take a look at that uh, in the next lecture. All right, you guys, I'm going to stop recording here.